On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including Elon Musk hyping up the SpaceX Starship and Mars Colony, Starlink satellites coming back down unexpectedly, a failed rocket test by startup company Astra, and the first images have come back from the James Webb Telescope. So, let's get going. This is The Space Race. On February 10th at the Starbase testing facility, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk held a live presentation to update everybody on the progress with the Starship rocket and his personal aspirations for colonizing Mars. It's been almost two years since the last time he did this. One of the things that Elon spoke a lot about was the launch tower for the Starship, also referred to as the Mechazilla by Elon on Twitter. But during the presentation, he mostly referred to it as Stage Zero, stressing that the tower was just as important and complex as the booster and the ship. They need all three for this idea to work. Prior to the event, we did see the tower use its chopstick arms to pick up the ship and place it on top of the booster section, which is pretty dope already. Elon spoke a lot about the importance of the aspect of rapid reusability, calling it the holy grail of spaceflight. He then says that SpaceX are aiming to aspirationally land on robotic arms of the tower. So it sounds like even Elon is still not convinced this can work effectively, at least not yet. Elon joked that if the booster does come down too hard and shear off the arms, then it would be a farewell to arms. But SpaceX are very clearly counting on the tower catch system to pan out in the long term. Elon was saying that they expect the turnaround time to refly each booster to be as little as one hour, while a ship would be ready to launch again within six hours of landing. Elon talked about the new heat shield for Starship, which is much different than what we are used to seeing on a vehicle like the Space Shuttle. The SpaceX design is a very precise network of hexagon tiles that they produce at a facility nicknamed the Bakery. Because Starship is made from stainless steel, the body already has a very high heat tolerance on its own, so the heat shield itself does not have to be nearly as thick as a conventional lander. Elon says that they took a lot of inspiration from roofing tiles when designing the Starship heat shield, and adds that every aspect of the heat shield design is to make it robust enough to support rapid reusability and ensure low cost per flight. We got our first confirmation about how the Starship would refuel in orbit. We've always known that the ship would have to dock with a tanker before it would be able to travel as far as the moon or Mars. And previously, it had been widely expected that the two ships would do a kind of ass to ass connection. But luckily, we now know that there will be an attachment point on the backside of the ship, so the opposite of the heat shield and that long vertical connection point will allow for the ingress and egress of propellant. Elon says that it is mostly the supply of liquid oxidizer that will need to be topped off for a long-range Starship flight. The Raptor engine version 2 was on full display at the event as well. We can very clearly see that it is a more simplified design this time around. We could almost call Raptor 1 a prototype and Raptor 2 the finished product because the first engine looks like an absolute rat's nest by comparison. Elon is saying that the max thrust output so far from the new Raptor is 247 tons and will probably operate for launches at around 230 tons of thrust. Elon thinks they can eventually push this engine to operate at 250 tons of thrust. The production rate for Raptor 2 is going to be about one engine per day, and that lines up pretty close with the company goal of building one full stack Starship per month, which would need 36 of these Raptors plus three or maybe six of the vacuum optimized variants. Moving on to more launch-based operations, Elon says that both Starbase and Cape Canaveral present options for developing Starship. He confirms that there will be a production facility and launch pad at LC-39A, where Elon says that they are already approved from an environmental standpoint for orbital launches, and worst case scenario, that would be the location for a first orbital Starship attempt. Elon says that the FAA should approve Starbase for orbital launch in March, but he doesn't get much info from the agency in the meantime. Either way, Elon says that he is highly confident that they will get to orbit this year. 
The plan for year one is basically to test the system using Starlink launches as the proof of concept, which is a really nice advantage that SpaceX have. They don't need to convince anyone else to put their payload into an experimental rocket. They can just fly their own satellites until it is well proven that the system works. Elon says that SpaceX are optimistically hoping to test the orbital refilling system towards the end of next year. But he concludes by saying that the primary focus of SpaceX right now is getting the Starship to orbit and then proving their return method for the booster and the ship. All right, now to Mars. We also heard Elon Musk talk a bit more about his vision for Mars, but he has yet to lay out any practical details about how that might happen. So Elon's ultimate goal with the Starship program is to eventually move 1 million tons of cargo from the Earth to Mars. That's how much stuff he thinks we will need to form a self-sustaining city on the red planet. And by self-sufficient, he means that if ships were to stop arriving from Earth for whatever reason, then the Mars city could continue on indefinitely. He also stressed that settling Mars at first will not be a fun time. Elon said it would be cramped, difficult, dangerous, and very hard work. He also added, that you might die in the process. According to Elon, we should look at Mars like a fixer upper of a planet that someday could be made as comfortable as Earth. And of course, Elon gave his standard talk about how we need to make human life multi-planetary. While the window to do so is still open, it might remain open for a very long time, but it might also be very limited. And therefore we have to make our move as soon as possible, just in case. But again, he gave very few technical details on how that happens. He mused that for medium duration crewed Starship missions of one to two weeks, the HLS moon landing for example, SpaceX could probably scale up the life support system that they use in the Dragon capsule. But in terms of providing life support for a six month Mars transit, he basically said they'll need to invent something new, but not quite sure what that is yet. Dozens of Starlink satellites have fallen back to Earth after being disabled in orbit by a magnetic storm. 40 out of the 49 Starlink satellites launched on February 3rd were destroyed by a geomagnetic storm in low Earth orbit that was triggered by an outburst of energy from the sun. A storm like this happens when the Earth's magnetosphere is impacted by solar wind. This particular hit increased the heat in the atmosphere and therefore an increase in the density. Since these satellites were newly deployed and had not risen to their operating altitude yet, they were hit by that increased drag and pulled down. SpaceX says the storm caused atmospheric drag to increase up to 50% higher than during previous launches. Luckily, the satellites are designed to incinerate completely when they re-enter Earth's atmosphere, so no pieces reach the ground that we know of. It looks like the debris was actually caught on video burning up in the sky over Puerto Rico. It's pretty crazy to watch. While it's probably not an ideal thing to happen, Elon Musk didn't seem too worried about the loss. He replied to a tweet about the incident with just three emojis, one for magnet, one for storm, and one for dead. And looking on the bright side, this is a real world demonstration that the Starlink failsafe strategy works. The disabled satellites simply fall down and burn up, no harm done. These kind of geomagnetic storms are not isolated incidents and will actually become more common over the next few years. These are triggered by outbursts from the sun, which goes through cycles of high activity and low activity. We are currently ramping up to the peak activity of the 11 year cycle, which is forecasted to arrive around the year 2025. This also known as a solar maximum. So we are likely to see more powerful outbursts hit the earth in the coming years, that will have destructive effects on even higher numbers of small satellites in orbit. On February 10th, Astra launched its Rocket 3.3 vehicle from the Florida Space Coast, marking their first ever launch from the southern US spaceport. They had previously only done test launches out of Alaska. The rocket successfully lifted off, and everything looked great until they reached main engine shutoff. This is the point where the rocket will coast out of the atmosphere as the payload fairings deploy and the rocket preps for second stage ignition. But what we can see from the live stream cameras is some kind of jostling inside the cargo fairings as the covers fail to deploy. They're supposed to just pop open and fall away, but they don't. After that, we see the second stage engine fire and separate the rocket, which seems to send the second stage spinning out into space. 
Following the launch, Astra released this statement. We experienced an issue during today's flight that resulted in the payloads not being delivered to orbit. We are deeply sorry to our customers NASA and the small satellite teams. More information will be provided after we complete a data review. It's not the biggest deal because this is still a fairly new company, as aerospace companies go at least, but the failed launches are starting to stack up for Astra recently, and given the fact that this launch had four customer payloads on board, they clearly expected it to be successful. But Astra's troubles aren't done with a failed launch. Shortly after the mission was lost, news broke of a class action lawsuit against Astra's CEO Chris Kemp and CFO Kellen Brannon. In the suit, plaintiffs claim that investors were misled by promises that were made with regards to such things as their launch anywhere capability and the effectiveness of its designs, amongst other complaints. Retail investors have clearly lost confidence in the company's stock as it plummeted from $5.68 per share to just $3.59, and that's about a 36% drop in one day. The first images from the James Webb Space Telescope have been revealed. It's nothing crazy yet, they are still in the process of aligning the 18 mirror dish array, but this is still really interesting. In a blog post February 11th, NASA shared a mosaic image from the initial alignment process. The image is just a bunch of dots, but when we figure out what we're looking at, then it gets pretty cool. Those 18 points of light in the image are all from the same star with the different points being from the web's different mirror sections. So we can see exactly how misaligned each of those gold-plated hexagons are right now. We're talking about a matter of microns that each mirror needs to move, and they each need to be adjusted until all of those points of light line up perfectly in one image. The entire process of taking these photos lasted nearly 25 hours, but the observatory was able to locate the target star in each of its mirror segments within the first 6 hours and 16 exposures. These images were then stitched together to produce a single large mosaic that captures the signature of each primary mirror segment in one frame. The images shown are only a center portion of that larger mosaic, a huge image with over 2 billion pixels. This will probably take a few months still to work out, but it's pretty neat to be able to watch the progress in real time. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.